clear now, the new slides. Can can everyone see the slides, please? Could you give us a yes or a thumbs up or a okay? I can see that people are oh good. Right, I can see them now. All right. Okay. Thanks for that. I'm a, a bit overcautious, but I've I've talked on for about fifteen minutes, then realised that no one could. Like I'd, I'd got my mic uh, muted, and no one could see the slides, so I was just talking to myself in the room. But that's good. So thanks for letting me know. So this is me trying to set you a, a purely academic exercise, although you will go out there into the public sphere. And it, it's necessary that you do do that because there's that feeling of what you're writing is going to be read by someone, probably by a complete stranger. Although in practice, lots of blogs, it's usually family and friends because you, when you've blogged, you feel like you need to tell someone. So you send them the URL, you send them the link and, they, and someone will read it and you ask them to comment on it. So again, more technically, we say, what's its value? And if we start in a research project, and this is going to be about the smallest possible research project you can get, a micro project is, what is the value of this to me? Meaning you, it might be some value to me as well, to me as Charlie, the researcher in travel writing. And then is the work good? And when I say good, I'm using it in the way that Spinoza uses the word good. And it's saying, is it good for the planet? Is it good for other people or other groups? Is it good for some other part of uh, um, the environment that we're working in and living in? And those are questions of axiology that are really important when you're doing anything to do with research. And you can keep them written down, keep them in the back of your mind. And as you're doing each of the thing, it each piece of writing or questioning, it colours and um, enriches and nuances what it is that you're choosing to do. So what does a travel blog do? I think it does six things at least that I've figured out over the few years, 10 years, say, that I've been working with them. In fact, I found an old one from 2006, so it's more like 14 years I've been looking at these and wondering what they're for. I think that at the top of the list is this idea of a personal development of your identity. And I trace this back to some reading that, um, that Foucault does. When Foucault's doing his PhD, back in Paris in the, when would it be, 60s, 50s or 60s, a long time ago. He read um, notebooks or hypnata, the notebooks that old Latin scholars had kept. Um, and he realized that they were doing a kind of journaling. They were writing down quotes from other authors and they were writing down their thoughts as they thought something out to their identity. <clears throat> and then a lot of these works obviously got copied and became books that people can read. And I think that's what's going on with travel blogging. You're keeping, <clears throat> and if, you, if you're um, self-aware, you're keeping a journal, you're journaling, and then taking from the journal <clears throat> and doing some new writing, composing a blog entry and posting that. So your own identity is changing each one you, that you make as you're doing each blog post. And your identity is being enriched by the material that you reach and pull in, just like those um, Roman and Greek authors that Foucault studied in his work. They're drawing in other people's writing, processing it in some way, and then using it to, to feed out to an archive, to take out of their archive. <clears throat> You are also archiving your own writing rehearsals. So I've been talking for a while later. <coughs> and I, I've only realized this over the years is that you're archiving your own writing and your own writing rehearsals in public view. It's, it was quite a while before I started to go back to series of blog posts, say six months worth of posts, and realized that they could be a travel, a travel book. And so I was rehearsing them in that space, in that public space, perhaps a hundred people were reading it, but then I was taking it, that archive, 
and improving. I hope, hopefully I was improving them and turning them into travel books. Um, or I sometimes rehearse uh, technical writing. What am I thinking of? Like essay type writing. And then that goes into journal articles or into book chapters or technical book chapters. The third one, and this is quite subtle and complex, and it, it, you probably don't realise this unless you're a project worker in some other way. And I think you guys are because you're doing um, photography projects and you have to build trust and reputation for collaborative working. The, in, in my field, in tourism management studies or tourism knowledge transfer studies that we talk about, we have th people called gatekeepers. So somebody who looks after the National Trust property where Agatha Christie used to live. And we're trying to build a trust, trust with them so that we've got a good reputation for collaborative working and they control the gate. They're gatekeepers that let you into that building because you perhaps you perhaps want to go out of hours or you want to go five times in one week and don't want to pay. So we need to get past the gatekeeper. So rather than trying to sneak past uh, in a, like a, a spy, like espionage, you build trust and uh, and get a reputation for good collaborative working with them. And the blog is a really powerful tool for doing that. It's a real trust builder. It's great to point forth for publicity and activism. So when you do want to tell people about your new book, you've got a ready-made audience there reading your blog. Um, or if you've been activist about a particular cause, um, it's a place where you can um, promote that activism, um, arrange to have events, uh, arrange and tell people dates, give people uh, packages of extra information. It's a web page for your links as well, so that if you're going to give a talk um, or going to have an activist meeting, is it somewhere to share that link so that the public can see it and join? It gives pleasure and value both to yourself. It's really when you start to enjoy writing, it is really enjoyable. It's really satisfying and. Um, gives you a sense of really good uh, accomplishment. And accomplishment is one of the, the great things that we that um, build us as humans that we look for. And it might be giving pleasure and value to a readership as well. Or it might be giving pleasure and value to someone with whom you're building trust if you're going to do some collaborative working with them. So it might be doing some publicity for them or some promotion for them. And then the sixth one, which is what I want you to do in the next month, is uh, research for place inquiry. So how it can be used as a phase in place inquiry to look at a particular spot. My spot that I'm working on for the one that's doing going really well at the moment is my place inquiry research on Wallonia. I like to pick places that no one's heard of, like, like the unknown town of Concano. Wallonia is the southern French-speaking part of Belgium. I know that you all knew that. And um, um, I'm working as a place brand ambassador with the, the DMO, the, the Tourist Information Office, for that part of Belgium. And looking at what it feels like and seems like for a British person, someone coming from England or Britain, trying to find their way to southern Belgium. And so I'm trying to look at things like um, routes and pathways. <coughs> Sorry, I've been doing too much talking. So routes and pathways into Belgium, but, but routes that might miss out traditional routes. I'm trying to find low carbon destinations for outbound UK tourists that are complex and unknown. So um, as, as we emerge from COVID, from lockdown, <coughs> People are trying to find ways of not using the plane. So is there a different way of going on holiday um, using ferry and train travel and trying to enjoy the journey as much as uh, enjoy arriving there? We've shifted the way that we consume tourism. We generally mass get there as quickly as possible and be in the resort doing something. But there needs to be a shift, I feel, as an activist, to enjoying the journey. So finding forms of transport that are low carbon or zero carbon and um, 
being on that journey as being part of being on holiday, of holiday making. So that's the type of research that I'm trying to do to see if any of these towns on this complicated map will give that to a British tourist outbound. The way I do it is I use narrative knowing, narrative at every point from this fantastic book. And there's a, a chapter here by Maria Tambuku. Might have, I'll, I'll show you later when we're, when we're on full screen again. And I try and use narrative at every point in the research process. Remember, I come from a background of um, social science and philosophy research, mainly social science research, which gave rise to anthropology and then anthropology um, spawned ethnography and I would say that I'm probably an ethnographer by um, by formation in a way coming from the industry and coming from the um, discipline subject discipline that I come from and so I use auto ethnography to try and understand personal value so I write about a place and in, the, in this post here I'm writing about Lille a, a town in northern France where the Eurostar stops and I'm trying to find out, use the writing to understand what's of personal value, the axia to me. So as you write and try and write a blog post that you're going to share, it reveals back to you what it is that is of value to you. And the way I do autoethnography is I write first and ask questions later, you know, a bit like shoot first questions later so I write my piece I store it for quite a long time and then I go and look at it again as if it were a piece of text by someone else and I say what's this person doing where are this where is the personal value to this person and read the text as if I was reading a, a, a novel or a poem or a, a technical report I also use narration to elicit uh, tacit knowledge in not just in myself, but in respondents too. So um, by narrating what I've written, it lets people come back in again to um, respond to me. This this word respondents in my subject field, let's get a pen working again, that's purple pen. This word's a technical word in ethnography, respondents. And it's anyone who starts to reply to anything that you're doing in the, if you're doing a dialogue or if you're doing a straightforward interview or if you're doing email interviews with people or if you get into a Twitter dialogue. People that remind to you in our research field, in my research field, we call them respondents. The narration too, so narrative here, it narrates, this is very similar, and I narrate in order to engage people in citizen science via social media um, and also to find respondents in Twitter. So I can put questions out there in the blog and in Twitter to ask really big questions. What's it like in Lille? What's it like in Liège? If I can't get there, which I can't at the moment, still can't travel. So you use it using narration to engage people in the citizen science and you might you might be reaching 4,000 people through your blog, but only four or five people will reply. But four or five people are very valuable to you as respondents. They're going to give you information about the, the railway station as it happened in the air, which I found out something about from a respondent. So that's really useful. Finally, when you've got respondents that are, that are on side, when you've built trust with them, is to do some narrative inquiry questions. And the classic one from uh, uh, Kathy Sharmaz and uh, uh, Reisman, who's another big researcher in narrative inquiry, they say, start questions with, tell me about the time you. So you elicit from the respondent what you do. And, and my particular example one was a, a chap who travels into Liège. He comes from a different part of Belgium, goes into the railway station, jumps off the train, walks across town into work. And so I elicit that from him by Twitter and by email. And eventually I compose him a more complex question because I find out something that happened to him, a story that happened to him, like he was late for his train one day. So he was able to go to the bookstore 
and tell me about the time when you went to the bookstore. And then they start to recount you a story. So you have that in narrative too. And then finally, with um, my, my theme of narrative at every point, my research output is literary travel narrative. So when I publish, I publish like W.G. Seabalt or like um, um, Lindquist and write sto uh, stories that have got the I narrator in um, telling the story in the past tense of what they did. Just to point you with this little diagram at the top here with Twitter, because this particular blog will only adopt PE, is hasn't got any comments box on it. And in fact, on my own web, web blog, I don't use the comments box anymore. I have to find, find another way to make respondents speak to me. So I use my Twitter account called Travel Writers On. And then through that, I can set up a dialogue with people through Twitter and find respondents. In order to narrate, I let the data in the researcher's memory speak by affect. And this method of inquiry is to push back into the past tenses. So what effect do they have on the researcher, on you as the narrator? And can they then express affect in a literary yet non-fiction way? And I'm constantly asking this question is, can you still be literary even though you're writing the truth? or you're writing non-fiction. And I feel as though it works. My, my current thinking and papers that I've published about it, I claim that it works. So what are the four past tenses and their effect to create affect? So there's a past simple, I walked, I was, we were. There's a past continuous, I was walking. And if you look it up on the web, you often get arrived at an American site and they call it the past progressive. I was walking. I had walked, which is the past perfect. You usually do that to prefix something. I had walked into the railway station and we know what's coming next. When? It, it seems to predict that word. That's the past perfect. There's a past perfect continuous. I had been walking for two hours across the city but still couldn't be. So you, it's um, it's usually a, a moment of dismay uh, when you couldn't find something. And that's the past perfect continuous. There are a couple of other tenses, which is, which is why I put four or six. And there's the habitual form of the past, which we prefix with used to. They would say, I used to walk along this street when I was a student. Back in the good old days when we used to go onto the campus, I used to walk across that little um, garden below the Drake's um, Reservoir. So I used to walk along it. I used to walk through that park. So you use used to and it, and it turns it into a verb. Lots of other uh, European languages don't have that used to. Um, and they use a different form of the verb to convey that habitual form, as they call it. Or we could say, I would walk through the park every day. So it's not conditional upon anything, although if it were raining, I would walk through the park is conditional. But we can use would when we don't, when we aren't being conditional. And then finally, the nostalgic present perfect, which is probably the seventh past tense. I have lived here since I was a teenager, but I wouldn't use that in mind because I'm trying to keep push back into the past. And you see that isn't strictly in the past. So I might meet you in the park in Plymouth and, and say, I've lived here since I was a teenager, but we're there together and it's a moment in the present. And really what I'm asking you to do is when you do your writing, particularly your third piece, in fact, your third piece, the third post, is that you push that back into these past tenses. One thing that I do when I'm exploring a new place is I create a literary geography of emotion from the novels of the region or the city. So um, I've just done, not just, it was um, through last summer, through lockdown, I couldn't get to Cherbourg. I'd won a research grant to go to Cherbourg with two 
two colleagues, Derek and Philip, Shepherd and Vassler. And we were all set to go on the ferry and then we were stopped. So it enables us to do a literary geography of emotion. And we found two novels for the city of Cherbourg. And in one in particular um, about a World War II scene, it was a like a, a biography written from people's diaries and interviews. And it formed a really good uh, backdrop for us to do what we call a literary geography. Some people call them emotional geographies of a town. And it's places in the city that formed an exciting emotion or even a frightening emotion for the people who lived there before. Um, the chapter, that book chapter is, I've, we've bought a copy for the library and it's in, um, it's in eBook Central. You have to log in first to um, Primo before it works in uh, Progress eBook Central. And you'll see where, I've, where the three of us have tried to um, really excavate and quarry that little novel, uh, or that biographical novel, to find places that would be of interest in Cherbourg, so that when we do go on field work, one day we'll be able to go straight to them and do the travel writing from I also tried to build a hexis, which is six plateaus in the town. And the novel that I've found, thanks to the blog, Be Wallonia, and thanks to the uh, links with them um, through Twitter to and finding new respondents and citizen science, I found that there was a Maigret novel, and I love Maigret novels, that set, a lot of it is set in Liège, which is one of these French towns in, in Belgium. And from reading the novel, to plot um, what I call a hexis. It's a single literary text which plots a route of affect and lines of fleeing within an urban space. And that's a step that I call knowing and it prepares me for field work. So I've got some names of places. I've got this railway station called the Guillemins, Guillemins railway station. And in fact, that's where um, one of my respondents He's the chap who goes to work now and the Giermans railway station has been rebuilt and he walks through it every morning and every evening on his way to and from work. What I'd love to find is that hotel, hotel of the railway, railway hotel, these streets, see if those streets are still there. And I could either continue to do these and find these streets by asking my respondents through the blog and through Twitter or I could wait until I get there, or which spoils it, it's both helpful, but spoils it, is to look on Google Maps and see if I can find those, and then see if I could draw a route. In my imagination, I imagine, because it's called the, the Hanged Man of uh, this church, San Folian Church, I, I'm trying, I imagine that the route might plot the route of the uh, Hangman's Noose, but we'll see, we'll see. That's a bit fanciful, that. This thing about being fanciful about um, urban spaces, which I do a lot, and which obviously happens in novels a lot, and which the literary travel writer is trying to communicate in order to pass on affect to his or her readers, is probably best described under the heading of topologies. And topologies uh, is how your view changes as you move around an urban space. For this photo, Apologies for my photography. I'm not a photographer. I'm a travel writer. And I've just realised I'm speaking to real photographers here. Um, I'm standing on the, um, the, the north quay of uh, the Seine on the, the little island, the Ile de la Cité, the little island where Notre Dame Cathedral is, you know, the one that burned down two years ago. <clears throat> and I'm looking across upwards but south onto the Latin Quarter, my favourite bit of Paris, and looking up these two, this, two narrow streets here. And I know that those people in those streets and in those flats and houses and apartments can't see these windows, these little doorways down on the bank of the Seine. And they can't see, they, I can see the backs of these green things, but from where I'm standing, I don't know what they are, but they know what they are when they look out of their windows. In fact, I do know what they are now. They're the little bookstores where the bouquinists open up every morning and sell their second-hand books from. 
So it's to try and show that this, when you're in different, as you move around an urban space, it changes your view of the city. And as you experience different emotions in those urban spaces, then that em emotion changes the topology of the city too. For example, that little street there is La Rue du Chat qui perche, the street of the fishing cat. And it's the narrowest street in central Paris. It's not that narrow there, but once you pass that white building, it's very narrow. It can easily touch each wall there. And it's really emotional space for me. So it changes um, our feeling of those buildings from when we first saw those photographs. And so the literary travel writer is always trying to create topologies, make topology happen and be sensitive to them in what other people tell the writer and in what other people are doing in that urban space. So we're trying to now set you an inquiry, an exercise to do for your three post travel blog. This exercise aims to get you started with your travel blog writing. It takes you through the design of three posts to your blog. They aim to give you direct practice in journaling, which you know I've talked a lot about this morning and held up copies of notebooks and um, some really good advice from Mark. And I, I'm really tempted to have a go at trying to do a recording and do it that way. And if you feel impelled to do it by um, by voice recording or a mixture of voice recording, then do. I've, I've not tried it, not properly heard of it before. Um, so it's to give you direct practice in journaling, making field notes, so doing something when you're out there in the field, writing something down and taking some iPhone snaps, preparing for field work, and then keeping a record of all this practice so you can go back and talk about it in a month's time and kind of um, explore it and see what it did for you. So there are three steps. So the first one is to get you to understand what Sartre and earlier uh, philosophical theorists thought and call the imaginary. It's a really difficult word for us in English, the imaginary, imaginaire, because the way that the French philosophers use it, it's a noun, the imaginary, whereas we use it as an adjective. We say my imaginary friend or my imaginary PhD, but it's, it's a noun for them, the imaginary, and it's a part of the mind. Look, I nearly used the wrong word there. I was going to say can be interrogated, but Sartre said it can't be interrogated quantitatively. It can only be interrogated for its qualities in there. And a classic one that he used to do is all of his friends, of course, <coughs> who lived up around on the Latin Quarter here would know this huge building, the Pantheon. And you, you may know it if you've been on holidays to, to Paris. It's a great um, tourist spot. I, I love it. It's a great building. And everyone knows that it's got masses of pillars in front of it. And you never think of counting them when you're there. I, I did once and I've gone and I've forgotten and I've lost the notes. <laughs> I did write it down, but it's gone. And then what Sartre would do is say, call it to your imaginary. So get a picture of the Pantheon in your imaginary. And the, his friends would say, yeah. You'll be sitting in a in a bar or a coffee shop down near the Sorbonne there. And imagine it, the Sorbonne's down here, down that way. And then he'd say, OK, how many pillars are there on the front of the Pantheon? And of course, none of them knew. There's a lot. There's, and they'd guess 14, 23. But it's, and they'd say, well, you, you've got the picture in mind. Count them. Come on, count them. And no, it's really, unless you've counted them and written it down and remember them, it's something about the way that the imaginary works. It's a really powerful image um, that you're holding of a place that you know really well, but it's really hard to interrogate it later and almost impossible to interrogate it quantitatively to find out a number from it. Is the six of them, is the 23 of them. I do this with my first year students. We go on a school trip to uh, Dartington Hall and there's uh, that huge um, medieval building there. And has it got three or four windows? And of course, the students can call it to mind. 
and even sketch it. But then you ask them how many windows, big stained glass windows there are in it, and no one can remember. I can't now, whether it's three or four. So that's the first one. And I want you in your imaginary, in the imaginary, is to call to mind a place that you know that you're going to be able to get to even during lockdown. And preferably for me, for my sake, somewhere that's a bit urban. So at least a building, even if it's only a, a castle or a building stuck on its own somewhere. So somewhere that's not too difficult because you were going to go and, or you're going to go and check it later. So it's somewhere that you know pretty well or even really well somewhere that you perhaps walk past regularly when you go in shopping or um, on your way to somewhere that you have to go to regularly. So you know the building really well and it's done something. It's kind of stayed with you for a reason. But you can call it to mind. And that's the first piece that you're going to write. And what I'd sort of like you to do, I'm not forcing this. And since Mark said that thing about recording, I'm tempted to have a go at this myself now by recording, but I, I sort of want to encourage you to use the suite of Google free uh, apps because uh, they work on the laptop and they work on all of the little machines or little smartphones as well, both iOS and um, and the Google one. No, I've forgotten the name of the operating system. Android, they work on Android and they work on iOS. And it's Google Docs, Google Drive, and eventually Google Blogger. Although, unfortunately, Google Blogger doesn't have an app anymore, not a free app anyway for the iPhone. So you'll have to go back to the lab, back to base or home to do the blog part, the writing part. So I've written these instructions out in a bit more long-hand way in a Google document. I won't go to it for a moment, but I'll come back to it in a moment. So step two, sorry, blog post one then, is from your imaginary, find a building or a street corner during lockdown, one you can easily visit and already know. So it needs to be local to wherever you're staying at the moment. If you're stuck in on campus uh, in student accommodation or you're stuck at home in your own little town in Cornwall or Devon, then somewhere that you can easily get to, but you, but you know it. Um, I, I do this, I write, I've said before, I write in um, these Evernote journals from Oxford notepads. And then I've just recently found out that if you photograph them with Google, with your ordinary camera on your phone, then upload them into Google Photos, embedded in Google Photos is Google Lens. And Google Lens has got really good handwriting recognition. And on a page of my text, I usually only have to make about six or nine corrections to what Google thinks has been written there. And you can do copy text from image. This is journaling. So you're doing your journaling. And then from your journaling, you'll compose your blog post one and post it. Not allowed to go to the place yet until that's well and truly posted and it's stuck there. Then a little time later, next day, preferably about two days, and when you, if you get into about a week, it's a bit too long. So you get to about three or four days and it's lost its, um, its value to you because you're trying to compare the imaginary with your experience of being in the place. So then you go out to the place. Does anyone know this Moon Street? It's a tiny little road that runs down from Exeter Road in Plymouth, down the back of Jury's Inn. And gives you a shortcut from the, the east side of the university campus down onto Sutton Harbour to a really good tourist location. And I use it a lot with my tourism students to, to get quickly from a, uh, an urban space down into a tourism space. I'm not asking you to use Moon Street. It's just one that I know really well. And when you get there, it's got a lot of powerful experience because it's the road's suddenly busy. You can just see that bus sneak in there. It's really scary. It suddenly gets really busy again after a quiet minute or so. It's got its street name really clear on the right on the corner. It's got a really distinctive colour. So it's, um, it's really helpful to locate it and find it again, both for travel writing and for tour guiding. 
And what I want you to do is when you found your place that was stored in your imaginary that you've already written about, is to open all of your senses when you're at the place and see and feel and experience being in the place. Take some notes either on in your hardback notebook and or with, with audio and then focus in on some specific point, uh, a stone, if there's a coloured stone in the wall <clears throat> and there's a lot here in South Devon, lots of uh, Plymouth is built from Plymouth limestone, its own kind of uh, flat grey, very matte limestone and occasionally you'll get a, a red rock from Paynton in the building wall. wall. So pick a particular stone and uh, Focus in on, or a lower window sill is always really good, a nice one to do. Lots of window sills in urban spaces, as you know, particularly pubs, have lots of spikes in the bottom of the window and wonder why they've got those spikes in the bottom of a pub window. And then walk in towards it, examine it in detail. All the time taking care of traffic. Sometimes when I'm work, working with a big group, you'll be working on your own, but with a big group is that sometimes you can get too absorbed in your work and it's good every now and then to, to heads up and then have a look and say, remember, you're in a busy street and that bus is coming around the corner. So uh, make sure you're safe as you do all of these things. <coughs> you know, don't you, your photographers? You get run over all the time and you're lost in your thoughts. <coughs> Then last bit whilst you're there, so I'm keeping things really small, so you don't want not too many, otherwise you'll be lost in the process. Uh, and my aim is to get you to have three blog posts manageable in less than a month. So then try a longer, more mobile process, for example, turn, turn and walk away for 20 meters and then follow a curved path back. I often talk about working on an ellipse, if I can draw an ellipse, like that. because often um, European cities have got water down at the bottom of a slope, and there's each of and then something important at the top of the hill there. So if you walk around the ellipse shape, it gives you a chance to walk around the town. I'm not asking you to walk around the town, I'm just asking you to walk away and then back towards your imagine a place that's in your imaginary that you're currently investigating the place that you're doing place inquiry step two upon and then write something else but write about the fact that you moved so that you've done some moving this is after all travel writing even though we're only in one place and travel writing has got to have some movement in movement of the travel writer or movement of something that happened in there, a tree branch blew, or some leaves rustled, or a bus went past, all in the past tense. Step three, so, oh, sorry, so you come back, back to base, blog that using your field notes. Step three, a little time after, two or three days after, this doesn't matter if this is a little bit longer, a week, or 10 days after, so for your third and final blog post, please move into the past tense and tell your readers what you did, how you went, how you found the exact spot in the field or did not find it. Sometimes when we've done these imaginary, the imaginary exercise, I need to use it as an adjective, an imaginary exercise, the exercise of the imaginary, we get to the place and it's not how you remember it at all. In fact, it's gone. It's been knocked down. Lots of places have gone. So how, how you found it or didn't find it and how you moved around in it. So you will have blogged this a little bit already, but this is you forcing yourself into the past tense. And those, use those four past tenses or six past tenses from the earlier slide. Be strict with them, check them, put them back into the past. I went, I walked, I sat while I was turning the corner, those past tenses. What did you discover? What did you experience? Here's some past. It's a little bit early, but that's past. Did, did. 
not what will you do or what do you do on Wednesdays, but did you discover, what did you experience? Check it, really check it, because often when you've written it <clears throat> towards the end, it creeps back out into the present tense. <coughs> and I'm trying to get you to write a story that happened to you in the past. So it's as close to being literary as it can be with nonfiction. Here, ag, <laughs> I was trying to draw a diagram of how there's some free stuff, the apps that Google lets you have for free, both on your phone and on your other devices, that at least gives you a, a working space, what I call knowledge management. Not just me as well, it's, it's a common term, knowledge management, knowledge management systems, so that you've, you can keep all of your texts in the various forms. In Google Photos, this one here that's free, it's now got Google Lens built into it. This is the formal icon for Google Lens, but it shows in the, it shows there, and you can copy text from an image that you've photographed. You can paste it then straight into Docs, and you can search across all of your docs. There's the search button. Oh, here at the bottom. So there. So you can type something into the search box in Google Docs and in Google Drive and search for text that you've already written. So it's a place where you could start to store your journaling, even though you're journaling from handwriting. Then if you install Google Play, um, it's, you access it through the Google browser on a big computer, like a laptop, but on the phone, it's app. If you've got free books from Google Play, eBooks, or if you bought books from eBooks in Google Play, then if you take notes in those eBooks, those notes go into a Google Doc, into Google Docs as well. It's, it's a bit of a discipline doing it. I, I've, I've had spates of doing it for a month or two and then forgotten about it again. So I'm not asking you to do too much on that, just to be aware of it. And it's suddenly you might take to it and it might be a really valuable archive building system for your own knowledge management system that you rely on. It's frustrating that if you bought something in Kindle from Amazon, it doesn't do it that way. <coughs> you have to paste it across. And then finally, the big one that's, um, that isn't um, an app anymore, a little bit frustrating. I think firms will start to make apps that you can buy to work with blogger.com. It's Google's blogger, but um, I'm not recommending you buy one. I think when you do blog, come back to base, be on a bigger computer, on a laptop, and do your blogging that way because I want you to blog um, texts that you've um, fashioned and composed and written and considered. So they're not notes, they're not field notes, they're, they're worked up into something that's literary. So use blogger.com, it's free. I've been, uh, that one that I showed you that Antonio used is probably seven or eight years old. So it's really stable, it's a really good stable product. It's really easy to use. <coughs> you don't seem to get any uh, um, spam from being on it. No one sort of bothers you on there. And it's really easy to share the URL, to share it with friends and family and, uh, and peers and other students, uh, other masters, postgraduates who you want to share your work with. So it's really, really, really easy to use it. And it's a nice contained three post. Um, exercise for you to have been through a whole process and learnt about place inquiry. So do sign up for that. I think that link works. I think I've set it so that it, it works on there and you can link, go direct through to Blogger. Obviously not on the video, but. Um, and then I said I've done the exercise in phone format. So you can either scan the QR code with your phone off that screen or click on the link. I don't think this will work for me. I think I'm going to have to stop share, go into it and then reshare. So bear with me a second. I'm going to stop sharing and share screen. And I've got it open in Google.
need to get it open first, it's in my drive. There it is. Screen and my drive. Right. So I know those instructions are long and difficult, and it looks like the recording has worked, but also as well, I've done the exercise written out as um, what I call a ramble strip, and it's a Google Doc and also a Word document stored in Google Drive that's narrow enough to read on the iPhone screen or the um, any any smartphone screen without having to scan backwards and without having to scroll sideways. <clears throat> People are quite happy to scroll up and down, but but scrolling sideways is um, is awkward. So it, it it lets you scroll up and down easily or as you're reading up and down the screen. And all of those instructions that I've just been through, talk through them again. A couple of little images to remind you of what we were talking about. And that's um, that should open on anything. And I've got a link to it from slides, and I've also put a scannable QR code. And that I tested that on my phone and it seems to take me to the right place. So that should work for you guys as well. Right, high noon. Have we gone over a time? I think we have. Whoops. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Let's stop the recording now.